Hi, I'm Lisa Wood, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. If fishing is your passion, you're lucky to live in Washington. We fish year-round, and there's always something to fish for. Here's one you might not have tried yet. Today we were fishing uh, kokanee in a western Washington lake. Um, kokanee, a landlocked sockeye salmon, um, offers quite a bit of recreational opportunity as we move into the summer months. Early in the spring, certainly trout kind of take the spotlight, but uh, kokanee is a real prize game fish. Uh, many anglers out here uh, targeting kokanee specifically. Um, and one of the things about kokanee that make it so uh, attractive to anglers is the, the quality of fish and the um, real sought after fish for uh, eating. Requires a little bit of a different approach. Uh, you saw us this morning, we're using downriggers. You don't see people catching kokanee from the shore like you would a rainbow trout, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity to fish. Kind of a, uh, a unique fishery, tech, more of a technical approach. Um, we're fishing down, like I said, on a, a downrigger. Um, using some flies and some attractors uh, with a little bit of shoe peg corn. Understanding which lakes contain kokanee I guess would be the first, first uh, place to start. Um, there's a variety of ways we can find out where kokanee are. Certainly you can call the Department of Fish and Wildlife, any one of the regional offices to find out which lakes have been stocked with kokanee. You know, word of mouth, uh, some of the websites out there uh, um, certainly talk about where kokanee are. I would certainly say that kokanee are a fish that tends to school up. Um, once you find the fish, that's probably one of the more difficult um, challenges to find out where the fish are at. Um, once you find the fish, targeting in on those fish, uh, certainly going back through an area where you've picked up fish either in the past or on the, on the same day. Um, um, as far as the water column goes, fish can be distributed throughout the water column depending on uh, water temperature, dissolved oxygen content. Um, the depth of the lake, and that, and that can change throughout the year as well. So um, it takes a little bit of experimentation at times to find the fish, but uh, once you find the fish, they're, 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 they're usually readily caught. You can expect kokanee fishing to continue to improve throughout the summertime as the fish grow. Uh, being a salmon, they do, they do die after they spawn or after, when they reach maturity. Um, kokanee typically reach maturity um, in many of the western Washington lakes at around three years old. Those fish continue to grow up until around October. Kokanee is around 11 inches to, to up to 14, 15 inches in, if uh, conditions are right. Kokanee have been stocked across the state of Washington in a variety of different lakes and reservoirs. Today we have fisheries or populations in approximately 39 bodies of water. The hatchery program is fairly large, so uh, today I believe our, our production level is about 11 million fish across the state. Kokanee have a very interesting following in that you've got guys that specifically target kokanee. These, these, these fishers will travel from lake to lake and op often travel great distances to eastern Washington and western Washington to, in pursuit of these, f these fish. Because it requires a technical, a little bit more of a, a different technical approach than other fisheries, uh, guys that, that really uh, hone their skills and get good at kokanee fishing can be very successful. Although kokanee fishing can look a little intimidating at first, once a guy comes out here and, and spends a little bit of time experimenting with a variety of baits and lures, fishing some different uh, depths and different lakes, it, it's not really too challenging. can find fish fairly easily. It can result in a quality experience. Here are other fishing opportunities in the weeks ahead. Washington ground squirrels are only above ground during the spring. That's when department researchers were trapping them to learn more about this candidate for the threatened or endangered species list. Once a squirrel's trapped in the cage, 
um, uh, assuming that it's a new capture, we, uh, um, one biologist will, will grab the squirrel and handle it by the nape of the neck. Uh, another biologist, uh, we work in pairs or, or, or groups of three. A second person will uh, apply an alphanumeric ear tag so that every squirrel has a unique uh, number so that over the course of time and in future years, we can track the weight gain and continued presence of the squirrel on the site. Uh, in addition, we measure the uh, uh, weight of the squirrel. We determine whether it's a male or a female. Earlier in the year, in February, we determine whether it's reproductively active. And we've also got series of, of individual independent trap sites. We're also keeping track on dispersal rates and, and what sex and age class uh, disperses uh, and what distances. Washington ground squirrels are, are unique and very interesting animals. Uh, through their annual seasonal cycle, they're only active and above ground maybe four or five months out of each year. Uh, females are bred in early February and uh, give birth to uh, eight or nine uh, live young in, in uh, mid to late March. Uh, the pups are weaned from the females by mid-April and, and come above ground to begin uh, their life as a foraging animal. One of the dominant and most important plant species for these squirrels is, is this grass right here. It's Sandberg's bluegrass. It's a native in the shrub step system in Washington. These ground squirrels are highly dependent on this, and they'll eat this and uh, native wildflowers uh, through uh, April and May, and uh, depending on how fast they uh, can gain sufficient weight, uh, male ground squirrels will begin an over-summer estivation period, which is similar to hibernation. Males will go below ground uh, often by early June, followed about two weeks later by adult females, and the young of the year may need until late June or even early July to put on sufficient body fat to uh, uh, endure and survive the uh, estivation period, which goes directly into an overwinter hibernation period. And the squirrels will be below ground and, and dormant until uh, late January or February the following year. The basis for the study that we're conducting is to examine the, uh, the demography or the population dynamics of ground squirrels uh, over time uh, in, uh, across the uh, variation in existing uh, vegetative cover types that are common in eastern Washington. Some of the sites are dominated by uh, native grasses such as Sandberg's bluegrass and blue bunch wheatgrass. Uh, along with native uh, wildflowers. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, several of the sites where we're working are uh, dominated primarily by cheatgrass and other non-natives. Uh, the reason for this, again, is so that we can examine uh, the effects and the interplay of uh, different vegetative uh, species and cover types uh, on uh, ground squirrel health and nutrition and, and see how that relates to overwinter survival, um, reproductive capacity, uh, and over general health of individuals in uh, one population uh, to the next. But Washington ground squirrels provide uh, quite a large number of uh, what we call uh, ecological services or benefits uh, uh, to the systems in which they live. One of the very important things that ground squirrels do that uh, burrow a meter or a meter and a half uh, into the ground, uh, as they excavate burrows, they push that soil upwards to the soil surface. And in doing so, they're aerating the soil there. They're an important food and nutrition source for, for a, a large number of other desirable wildlife species. And this list includes badgers. It includes all of the raptors, from falcons to ferruginous hawks, red-tailed hawks. Uh, during the early part of the ground squirrel season, they're an important food source for northward migrating raptors, such as northern harriers. They provide a varied number of uh, ecological services. One of the fastest growing pastimes in America is bird watching. You see a bird, then you watch it. There has to be more to it than that. Well, there doesn't even have to be any more to it than that. Actually, for me, lots of times, just seeing the bird and watching it is, is alone just enough of an experience, just to remind me of, of the natural world out there, or just to enjoy the color and the beauty of the bird moving, or just the unexpected surprise of, of a landscape that suddenly has life and motion in it. And lots of times that is just enough for me, but it, it, most of the time it really isn't. I want to know what kind of bird that is. Sometimes that's easy to figure out. It's a bald eagle. That's pretty easy. Or sometimes it can be pretty hard. Telling the flycatchers apart or telling different sandpiper species apart can be a real challenge. 
Sometimes I just want to know what the bird's doing and why it's doing it. Why is it here at this particular time? Why is it behaving in this way? Why is it doing something that I've never seen it do before? Or singing a certain song that's different than the others of its species? So it can take you in a lot of different avenues. One bird can just be an experience or it can be the beginning of a long path. And that's all part of it, is not only the, the beauty of looking at the birds, which is probably the main thing that catches people into birds in their songs, um, but it's a, being able to travel to different habitats, to the top of mountains, to deserts, to different countries. There's always going to be birds. Uh, the reason I got into birding was um, I took a class, an ornithology class, with uh, Dr. Huffman in uh, San Marcos, Texas when I was going to school there and it just opened up a whole new world. Um, one of his uh, <laughs> field trips was to go out and we would get quizzed on the naming the birds just by their songs and uh, it just opened up a, a like peeled back the onion if you want to call it that and just opened up a whole new world for me and I've been birding ever since. By now, we hope you know Washington has special wildlife license plates. The plates are sold by the Department of Licensing and have taken their place among many plates that support a lot of good causes. I think the plates really give an opportunity for Washington residents to show their hobbies or their interests. And it's kind of exciting. The new plates are really colorful and um, they show a lot of different attributes of Washington, whether it be lighthouses or elk and deer and colleges, so they're a little bit way across the board, so it gives a lot of opportunities for people to buy new plates. Since January 3rd, all of the new specialty plates have sold very well. Um, in particular, the Fire from Fish and Wildlife um, have sold varying amounts. Um, the elk plate has sold over 700. Um, the eagle plate has sold over 600. Um, the orca plate um, is now up to about 550. Um, and then the bear and the deer have individually, individually sold over 250. Um, the revenue from those plates, um, when customers purchase them, it costs $40 plus additional licensing fees. $28 of those fees actually goes to the Wildlife Fund. And that money helps to support different wildlife activities in Washington. Um, and then each year, when the customer renews their tabs, um, they can pay an additional $30 to keep that plate on their car. And again, $28 goes back to the Wildlife Fund and it continues to help wildlife activities in Washington. Um, all of the new special plates fund different activities, whether it be at different state agencies or a lot of nonprofit organizations. Um, they range from supporting lighthouse restoration to scholarship foundations. Um, to supporting education of children, supporting state and national parks. All the plates really support great activities and organizations in Washington. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Please join us again.